This is KTN News. I could see her hand folding. She's getting paralysis as I'm seeing. Her eyes are dilated. He asked out loud, why would anyone put you on a drug, on this drug for this long? The doctor said that he should be lucky that I survived. Many women die on the table. That's when I knew all was not well. Over the past 20 years, Hundreds of medical negligence and misdiagnosis cases have been reported in Kenya. While many of the cases have been resolved by courts of law and the Kenya Medical Practitioners and Dentists Board, others are still pending. Africa Uncensored has discovered serious weaknesses in Kenya's healthcare system that have left many Kenyans either disabled or dead. On an ordinary day, George Moshiri leaves his home in Nairobi's Eastlands and goes to the shopping center. His daily routine includes making calls to business clients. On this particular day, he needs airtime and has to get it himself. There's no one around he can send. If there's nothing else to do, the 52-year-old father of one heads back home. He has been doing this for the last 15 years. Living independently is a challenge that he confronts every day. I lost my sight under very sad circumstances. I was coming from uh, an evangelistic meeting um, in Kajiado, where I was based. That was in 2001, March 30th. Uh, one evening, as, uh, as I was coming from the meeting, I came. I was just okay. I came to my place where I used to stay at servant quarters, government quarters, sorry. And uh, I woke up the following morning experiencing a lot of dizziness and uh, headache. And I could, I could see the, the house, the room of my house, you know, kind of going in circles. Two days later, George visited a clinic in Kajiado. He was told he had malaria and was anemic. Things got worse. He would later be admitted at Kajiado District Hospital in critical condition. So when I was lying on my bed, let me come back to that, I saw two nurses coming towards my bed and they injected me on my left arm with the IV, the drip and then they left. So I was just staring at the drip as it was dripping, and then eventually I slept, only to wake up the following morning, hearing some commotions here and there from people I could recognize, some I could not recognize quite well because even I noticed my hearing had partially, uh, was partially affected, was partially affected, uh, meaning that I was partially deaf for that matter. I could not hear properly. And um, I could also hear some utensils, people, you know, moving some utensils. And then I asked myself, why aren't the people switching on the lights? And yet I can hear all that commotion. That's when I took courage and uh, I asked the time. I was told it's 10 a.m. in the morning. 
that's when I knew all was not well. And I made an announcement that I can't see, I'm blind. At that moment, George was in the dark about his blindness. Nobody explained to him what had happened. Instead, the doctor tried to restore his sight by giving him a blood transfusion. All too late, this should have happened as soon as George was admitted. I came and I realized probably my life has come to an end in terms of, uh, in terms of livelihood because I just wondered how I could continue with my work since I was a motor vehicle technician by profession with the Ministry of Public Works in Kajiado. A day later, George was transferred to Kenyatta National Hospital where he learned what caused his blindness. An overdose of quinine. In just one night, George's world was shoved into permanent darkness. He was 37 and a bachelor at the time. He would marry 11 years later at a ceremony that was held at Jericho Seventh-day Adventist Church in Eastlands. Over the years, his wife and family members did all they could to bring back his sight, but did not work. Wakati moja tulikuwa tunapiga story na mshiri. Na kuzui macho yake. Eh wakati moja kaniambia nikamwambia mshiri. Tunaweza toa sio moja ni ku ni kupe. Wakuweke kwa hiyo yako. Mshiri kaniambia pana. But although George is visually impaired, he can walk, unlike Abdullah Kibibi. Kibibi has been bedridden since 2012 after her neurosurgery went wrong at Aga Khan University Hospital in Nairobi. She had been diagnosed with bleeding within the area between her brain and the tissues that cover the brain. Her mother, who is a medical doctor, claims that the neurosurgeon delegated the surgical operation to medical students who repeatedly poked her daughter's brain. The student even poked the head seven, six to seven times without success. So then they, brain, they, uh, they destroyed the brain tissue. And by the time my daughter came back to the ward when I saw her, being a medical person, I could see her hand folding. She's getting paralysis, as I'm seeing. Her eyes are dilated. I actually screamed. And I said, this is not a patient for a general ward. Could you rush my daughter to ICU? Dr. Sadi alleges that the operation was done two weeks after the first one proved ineffective. She still recalls the events of 20th July 2012 when Kibibi underwent her first surgery. They gave me a form to fill, the one for the theater. Then uh, I asked them, what are the risks of the operation you are going to do? They told me that it is risk-free because it is a little bit water we are seeing in her brain and we just want to uh, drain it. So I said, fine, I gave them a consent. But the consent I gave was a VP shunt which is put internally. When they went to the, the to theater, she came back with a different gadget, which is we call XEV, the, the external um, ventricular uh, shunt EVD device. So day one, already from the 20th, that is now 20th because she was admitted on the 19th. This now is happening on the 20th. Already day one, things had already started happening which were not normal. The device would later dislodge, prompting a correction of surgery by Dr. Mubashil Mahamud Qureshi, the neurosurgeon who had been attending to Kibibi. The hospital calls me, Professor Qureshi wants to speak to you. I said, why, now about what? Because I left Kibibi fine, as something happened. Then he told me that uh, the XCVD that they put apparently wasn't working. But he didn't know that I'd realized that it had, had stopped working, it dislodged 
five days before the day he was talking to me. You know, at that point, they, are not, they were not aware that I'm a medical doctor. So I, I paraded myself like a mother and not a medical doctor. So when he said, he told me he's rushing to theatre at 11 o'clock, I told him, fine, I'll come and give consent for a, v, uh, a, a VP shunt, which I had already given anyway, but let me just come back. So I went to the hospital, found my daughter. She was a little bit, she was talking, but she was low. So we talked, I prayed with her, took her to theatre, and they went for the second operation. But even after the operation, Kibibi's health got worse. We stayed in ICU for quite a long time, and uh, she lost her speech. She lost, um, she was uh, paralyzed, she couldn't do anything. We were feeding her using tubes, and uh, we were on diapers now. There was nothing we could do, she couldn't be moved. And uh, that situation persisted for a long time. Dr. Sadi alleges that Dr. Kureshi refused to meet her to explain what had happened to Kibibi. I even sacrificed a Sunday so that we could sit. When he gave me appointment, a confirmed appointment on Sunday at 9.30, I went to the hospital to meet him. And then two, I stayed two hours. Then he told me he had an emergency in Empisha and he was not going to come unless I wait for a long time. So I decided, okay, if you give me precise time, I will wait. But he said he doesn't know when he's coming. So I went to church and I did not go back. So he dodged me until one day I decided to leave here at about five o'clock because I was told he does round quite early. So at five o'clock when he came to do the round, he found me seated near my daughter. Then when I asked, he said, no, 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 this is something we are managing, whatever. He didn't want to, to engage me in a talk. So I left him. I called Dr. Kureshi seeking to find out from him what exactly happened. Hello, good afternoon. Am I speaking to Dr. Kureshi? My name is Dennis Mbae. I'm a journalist. I work with Africa Uncensored. And I'm calling you seeking a response to a number of allegations uh, against you by a patient who you once attended to at Aga Khan Hospital. This is a, a young man from Tanzania uh, who uh, comes and seeks opinions from various doctors. Sorry? And he comes and seeks opinions from various doctors. And when uh, he comes, he makes allegations against the other doctor that I was mistreated, I was uh, in this misdiagnosis, I don't feel well, I don't feel well. No, it was, it was not a young man, it was a, a lady. I think this is a different case, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, so that one, I, I think you have to do. Maybe you could put a in the office, then you can take the response Shortly after making the call, I made an appointment with his office and we agreed that I would interview him. That interview never materialized. I was hoping to speak to Dr. Kureshi a few hours ago, but he cancelled the interview in the last minute, saying he would not be able to meet me in person. He, however, sent me an email, which I'm currently going through, addressing some of the issues I had raised with him concerning Abdullah Kibibi. He says, and I quote, The matter was thoroughly reviewed by our hospital committee, as well as the Kenya Medical Practitioners and Dentist Board. Both concluded that normal practice occurred in Ms. Kibibi's management, and the matter was therefore resolved. Any other issues related to this patient, her family and the institution, are being handled by the hospital's administrative and legal team. I am therefore not able to comment on the matter. End of quote. Kibibi was born in this hospital 37 years ago. At age 12, she sustained a hand injury from a car accident. Her mother believes this could have contributed to her bleeding condition at the time she got admitted at Agakan University Hospital. After the first two surgical operations seemed ineffective, 
Kibibi underwent a third surgery, but this time in the hands of another neurosurgeon. It is alleged that the neurosurgeon found brain tissues lodged in the pipes that had been attached to Kibibi's head. By the time of the operation, the hospital bill had run into millions of shillings, whose payment gave rise to a prolonged tussle between Dr. Sadia and Aga Khan University Hospital. I said I wouldn't pay the bill until it has been established who exactly is responsible for which part of the bill. Because already for me, a medical practice had, had happened. Five years before Kibibi found herself at Aga Khan University Hospital, a male patient who had cut short his trip to South Sudan was wheeled in. Simon, not his real name, complained of severe chest and stomach pain, which he mistook for a heart attack. I received uh, emergency care, they treated me. But then now the follow-up started, because I was wondering what is going on with you. And as I was doing the follow-ups, they discovered first and foremost that I had um, what you call a hiatus hernia, the medical um, condition whereby your stomach, the, the lining uh, uh, separating your, your stomach from your chest cavity is weak. So it's as if your stomach prolapses upwards. And one of the side effects of that was First, I had very frequent uh, stomach infections, which I never understood where they came from. It really concerned me for a long time before that. And um, hyperacidity, very, very serious acidity. It was a kind of acidity that would make a man cry. The doctors recommended an immediate operation, but Simon opposed it. When I asked them the success rate, they told me 50-50. And in my experience, when you speak to the majority of Kenyans, and they tell you 50 is, 50, 50 is like something like 70, 30, you know. 50, 50 is like, this is half a chance that you're not going to succeed. Simon was then introduced to a gastrologist who would help him manage the levels of acidity in his stomach. And this guy is said to be one of the best. <clears throat> He's one of the big names around town. So he came <clears throat> and um, he visited me at the, the hospital and he prescribed a drug, a drug called Nexium. Um, he gave me a prescription for about three months and you know, asked me to keep seeing him. So I did, you know, I was taking the medication, I was going to the clinic, I was seeing him, um, paying the 5K, you know, you walk in, uh, and he doesn't even tell you anything. Uh, <laughs> how are you doing today, how are you feeling, okay, fine. Here's the next prescription. So I did Nexium, I did Nexium for some time, and I started feeling really good. You know, I was now back. I was working, partying, traveling, you know, and the honey was not disturbing me. Uh, I had the problem of recurring um, stomach infections, but uh, at that point, that was really it. It was not um, bothering, it was not interfering with my life too much, I could cope with it. Simon continued to take the drug for a period of six years, unaware that it was causing disastrous harm to his body. I lost weight, um, my skin started looking peculiar, you know, people started talking about me, I lost face, I became, you know, it has this effect on you of you not you lose confidence and you start to even question, you know, what's happening to me. It is until Simon underwent several tests at the Nairobi hospital that he learned the cause of his poor health. One of the things he discovered was that he had a bone mineral density problem. The doctor panicked and asked, You're, at your age, you cannot be having a, this, this kind of problem. You know, how, how do you have this? Do you have a history of this? I told him, no, you know, I mean, my grandmother is 90, what, 96 now, on my mother's side. Grandfather, my father's side is also in her 90s. Um, both grandfathers have died, but one thing that is not there is this um, kind of problem. So we spoke and um, they did their 
to do this homework. Then at some point, he decided to read my notes. And a huge file of all these tests. So he took his time, told me, give me a few days. There's some professor there really did a good job by me. So he read and read and read and came back and told me, how long have you been on this drug? I told him, well, even before I went to Nairobi Hospital, because I was then being treated exclusively at the Aga Khan, I was already on the drug. So I counted for him. Then he asked me, he asked out loud, why would anyone put you on a drug, on this drug for this long? And then he realized what he had done. Simon would further learn from the doctor that the drug inhibited calcium uptake and thus weakened his bones, rendering him immobile at one point. So he explained to me what happens, you see? So I asked him, why, why did he do that? Then he, tells, he says to me, no, you'll have to go and ask him yourself. I can't answer that. You know, I have to ask the other doctor. That bothered me because You know, I felt like they're closing ranks on me, you know. Why do I need to ask him? You need to, you're in a position to explain to me um, uh, what, what took place. That marked the beginning of a harrowing medical journey that cost Simon his family and friends and drained all his savings. He wouldn't disclose the identity of the gastrologist nor allow us to investigate him. Afraid of the consequences of going against such a senior doctor, in spite of the trauma he had suffered because of the medic. In 2009, when Simon was still under medication, Jerry Mwangi walked into Family Care Medical Center at Phoenix House in Nairobi for a self-request scan. She was four months pregnant at the time. The doctor's diagnosis was that the heart rate of the fetus was faint and had to be removed. She panicked. In all that panic, I went in and he did the evacuation. Now, after that, of course, I was, it's, it's, a, it's, it's you're discharged like shortly after. So I went home, but I had such intense pain from that day for like three days. And by the third day, I was bleeding intensely. Unknown to Njeri, the fetus was still in her womb. She passed out in her house and was rushed to the Nairobi hospital by a friend. The evacuation procedure was done all over again. I was even shown by the doctor who did it uh, the second time, the, what they called post, post uh, the, 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 the product that had been removed, which is what should have been removed the first time. So for me, I was like, so what did the first doctor do? And my doctor said at the time, I can't explain or I can't, um, I can't tell you what the first doctor did, but I can tell you what I did. And he showed me the product of conception, which is, yes, which is what they call it, product of conception. Jerry claims that the first doctor who she identified as Stephen Minor became defensive and rude when her husband confronted him. The doctor said that he should be lucky that I survived. Many women die on the table. And for me, that was shocking that a doctor would use that tone and that language to say that we are lucky. I felt. For a moment there, like I was um, a specimen, you know, like an experiment, you know, because the tone and the language he used was just absolutely wrong. And we, we had just lost a baby. Dr. Minor denied the allegations and accused Jerry's husband of being violent and blowing the matter out of proportion. The same year, Jerry's husband filed a complaint with the Kenya Medical Practitioners and Dentist Board. In a letter dated 10th July 2009, the board wrote to Dr. Minor requiring him to give a comprehensive report on the alleged medical malpractice. The matter proceeded to hearing during which Dr. Minor revealed that the machine with which he carried out the evacuation at Tempisha Hospital had a problem. So he was admitting that something happened, something wrong happened, but he didn't follow up. I visited Dr. Minor at his office in Nairobi to get his response on the incident, but he declined to comment. Instead, he told me to go to the medical practitioners and dentist board, which I did. Daniel Yumbia, the board's CEO, however, could not talk about the case. There is one thing I must tell you in camera. 
I cannot discuss a specific case uh, unless uh, there is consent from that complainant. Uh, we are bound by the laws. Uh, CAP 253 does not allow the board to discuss a particular case unless we are giving judgment. So I cannot discuss that case you want to allude to because we are not allowed by law. And uh, if we did, we could even be sued. According to Njeri, the board never got back to her and she has not received a verdict to date. Yumbia, however, disputes this. There is no case, no case, which is pending unless it has legal implications. We have determined all the cases, the pending cases are cases that are recently received. We cleared off the cases. And I would challenge you to go to my legal department, discuss with them that particular case you are looking at, and I must tell you that uh, we have already determined all the cases. The 49 cases are recent cases. We cannot move back and say we take seven years. It is not practical. Jerry insists she is yet to receive any communication from the board regarding her case. Are they still investigating six, seven years later? I don't understand why it would take a whole board like that. They've already, they put down their building, they build a new one. They've still not given me a ruling. Jerry isn't the only one who is still waiting to get justice from the Kenya Medical Practitioners and Dentists Board. On 17th September 2012, Dr. Sadia, through her lawyer, Professor Kemo Angai, lodged a complaint to the board accusing Dr. Kureshi and Aga Khan University Hospital of medical negligence. The hospital responded through Dr. John Tolle, the chief of medical staff at the time, who said, quote, that the patient developed complications are not at all an indication of negligence. Rather, these are recognized to risk profile of the procedure undertaken, and any complication developed were wholly unintended and unanticipated. It is categorically denied that there was an alleged botched, foul, and negligent operation on 7 August 2012, unquote. The board gave its verdict on 30 October 2013 and stated in part, quote, Aga Khan University Hospital is hereby strongly admonished for failing to clearly indicate on the consent form that doctors undertaking postgraduate training may participate in active management of patients under supervision. The hospital is hereby directed to pay 150,000 Kenya shillings to the board as part cost of the seating of the board within the next 30 days from the date they are in, unquote. The file was closed with a recommendation that the hospital enters into a mediation agreement with the complainant and reports to the board within 30 days from the date of the ruling. This did not go down well with Dr. Sadia. I went back to the lawyer and I talked to Yumbuya. At one mo moment, May 2014, I was launching, we were launching the uh, National Patient Right Charter in May. I pulled him aside and I said, that decision is not uh, good. I need the technical committee to review that decision. That review is yet to be done. The civil lawsuit filed by Dr. Sadia at the High Court in Milimani was struck out in January last year following a recommendation by her lawyer, Professor Kema Wangai. Professor Wangai explained his action to me in a phone conversation. The order that was there mm -hmm. was to withdraw the case. Yes. Because the reason was that if the case could not proceed, mm -hmm. Because KBB is still in hospital. Yeah. So the case was not ready for trial. Mm -hmm. And so in any event, the defendants are still treating. They are still treating. Professor Wangai defended his recommendation, saying it was the right one under the circumstances. He denied that the case had been dismissed as per the court documents, insisting that it had been withdrawn. What has been happening is that the hospital has been trying to have Sadia uh, remove the daughter from hospital, mm -hmm. and she has refused. Mm -hmm. So it became difficult to proceed with that case. All right, and because Kibibi remains discharged, now the, the 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 mother is not picking the child from the from the hospital. So from a legal point of view, you can't proceed. Mm -hmm. So are you saying you're not? So the wisdom was that until all those things are regularized, then we relaunch the case back in court. 
And did you inform Dr. Sadia of uh, yes. the withdrawal? She's aware. she's aware. But she claims that you did not inform her. No, she's aware. The only thing is that she has a fight with the Gagan Hospital. She doesn't want Kibibi to leave hospital. And as a lawyer, we cannot fight for such things. <laughs> Aga Khan University Hospital declined to comment, saying the matter was still in court. This is not true. The suit was struck out of a year ago by Justice Joseph Sagon, who ordered each party to bear its own cost. In an email through its public relations office, the hospital told me it has a duty to uphold utmost confidentiality and thus cannot discuss or disclose any patient information. In the history of the Kenya Medical Practitioners and Dentists Board, only one doctor has ever been registered. Four doctors have had their licenses cancelled, while 104 medical stroke dental practitioners or institutions have been admonished or cautioned. Victims of medical malpractice such as Simon have lost confidence in the board's performance. He did not consider seeking redress at the board. You go to that board, <laughs> it's a joke. It's a joke because these are people this person who is sitting on that board was taught by the person you're going to report. How are you going to do that? If you do a little research, you realize you cannot uh, deal with these people. There's no way you can rely on them to police themselves. Dr. Uma Oluga, the Secretary General of the Kenya Medical Practitioners, Pharmacists and Dentists Union, also believes the board has not done its best. The medical board has failed. The, the, the public, I, I want to say that categorically, but the medical board has equally failed the doctors. So it's not that the doctors are happy about these things, because you find that the story of one doctor is going to be spread all over, 